the camera. Just give, it, give it off, give it off, give down, it, down. Give it. The best historical films not only relate a hopefully accurate portrait of a time unfamiliar to us, but do so engagingly. Anyone who sat through a junior high history class will know just how sleep-inducing a dry recitation of facts and places can be. Hollywood initially took the opposite approach, with many of the early historical films appearing as grand, expensive epics. That era probably drew to a close with the massively expensive Cleopatra of 1963, but just a few years later, a small British film called A Man for All Seasons, made for one-tenth the amount of money, wound up being much more critically successful, earning six Oscars and almost universal acclaim. Based on a stage play, A Man for All Seasons helps illuminate the tricky moment in British history when King Henry VIII attempted to secure a divorce from his wife Catherine of Aragon from Rome and failed to do so, prompting him to declare himself the supreme head of the Church of England. This understandably upset many English Catholics, including Thomas More, who had previously been made Lord Chancellor. The inability of Moore to accede to Henry's wishes causes a bit of turbulence in the relationship. I am no queen! Catherine's not my wife! No priest can make her so! And the film examines the machinations that went into toppling Moore from his position and ultimately delivering him to the executioner's block. I am brought here at last. Brought? You brought yourself to where you stand now. From the start of the film, it's clear that Paul Schofield's performance as Moore is a special one, as he reacts to all possible slights and dangers with a winsome sangfroid, always ready with a dry, witty response in the face of threats to his career, family, and ultimately his life. I should keep my word to you. Then what has become of your oath of obedience to the king? You laid traps for me. He's not unfeeling, he just acts with the knowledge that he is in the right. A man of conscience, he acts according to the dictates of his religious self and cannot be convinced to bend to the will of anyone who tries to tell him that his religious impulses are incorrect, as many around him ultimately do. A lawyer and a lawyer's son. We're supposed to be the proud ones, the arrogant ones. We've all given in. Why must you stand out? God damn it, man, it's disproportionate. Of course, that winds up being a dangerous course of action, and to protect himself and his family, Moore decides to simply keep his mouth shut. He refuses to bless the marriage of Henry to Anne Boleyn, quietly resigns his position as chancellor, and returns to his country estate, assuming that he'll be left alone so long as he doesn't speak out too loudly. Unfortunately, that's not to be. Henry, played with a wonderful childishness by Robert Shaw, is intent on pressing the issue, perhaps correctly interpreting Moore's silence as an implied censure. His chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, is his primary attack dog here, looking through Moore's past associations for anything that might be capable of bringing him down. Cromwell, are you threatening me? My dear Norfolk, this isn't Spain, this is England. What follows is a series of frankly beguiling conversational set pieces. Like any play that's adapted for the screen, A Man for All Seasons suffers somewhat from consisting of little more than people talking to each other in small rooms. But when a film is as well written as this, it's hard to complain. Schofield's performance is more is rarely fiery, instead relying on its intelligence to always stay one step ahead of the men who are attempting to catch him in some small slip of the tongue. Imagine Neil Macaulay from Heat as a theologian, and you might get some idea of the way Moore dances around Cromwell. In the end, Moore never compromises his ideals, but neither does he give Cromwell any rope to hang him from. Cromwell has to rely on a villainous John Hurt to perjure himself before the court in order to obtain his conviction. He said, Parliament had not the competence. Or words to that effect. As an historical document, this movie does elide some of the more unpalatable aspects of Moore's career, such as that he might have burned a few Protestant heretics at the stake and viciously pursued those who attempted to translate the Bible to English. It also uses some tricks to paint Moore in an especially good light, literally. You'll notice that Moore's house is always bathed in bright noontime sunlight even when the time is supposedly well after sunset, such as when Moore and his wife are heading to bed. The rest of the world is almost always overcast if not presented in the dead of night. This is hagiography, both figuratively and literally, as Moore was eventually canonized by the Catholic Church for his martyrdom, but sometimes hagiography is worthwhile if it results in a character as likable and, dare I say it, inspirational as the Moore represented in this film. 
Although the more of a man for all seasons might be an idealized version of the historical figure, erasing his faults results in a character that feels like the man we all imagined we would be in the face of overwhelming pressure. Willing to test the maxim, let justice be done though the heavens fall, when a more realistic outcome is that our heads will be falling into a wicker basket. Whether or not you or I will ever face a trial like Morris is doubtable. What isn't doubtable is that A Man for All Seasons is one of the great films of the 1960s and is still easily mesmerizing well, today. Guilty. Your life lies in your own hands, Thomas, as it always has. Is that so, my lord? And I'll keep a good grip on it. That'll do it for another edition of Screen's Besties, where we're always happy to talk about our favorite films. If you haven't checked out A Man For All Seasons, take a look at it on Netflix Instant Streaming and check back on screen soon for another thrilling video feature. Thanks.